Today's webinar is going to focus on a number of tools, formats, and specifications that are available to you and any, everyone for that matter, uh, which I hope will help you to create or develop your digital publishing platforms. Occasionally I'm going to refer to propri proprietary paid software, uh, but the focus of this webinar is on open source applications and formats. Um, I'm definitely biased with uh, regards to my opinion about open source applications, uh, but I will address some of the drawbacks to this approach at the end. So uh, why open source technologies? Uh, basically because EPUB is an open standard and open standards uh, deserve open applications. I don't feel that ebook developers should be limited to the high cost, uh, multi-licensing fees, etc., and proprietary file formats, and that's a big problem. Uh, of you know, the big four spring to mind, which are Adobe, Apple, Microsoft, and Avid, uh, who publish Pro Tools. Um, I mean, there's countless others, but those are the ones uh, who I think are the big, uh, big problem with regards to ebook development. Um, now, there are thousands of people on the internet and have been for years who have been pounding away on personal and professional projects to bring us top-notch software and formats that are applicable to all manner of digital app publications, and they're open source. Now, um, I adore open source applications. Uh, if you don't know who the little penguin is, that's Tux from Linux. Um, Open source has been near and dear to my heart since I think I first installed Linux Slackware 3.0 sometime in the mid to late 90s. Um, in fact, I can largely credit open source applications and software with my love for and understanding of computers. Uh, before deciding to wrestle with this stuff, and trust me, if anyone's installed Linux, they, uh, especially back in the 90s, they'll know uh, how difficult it was for someone who didn't know a lot about computers. Uh, between the disk partition tables, uh, the software packages, drivers, and the internal kernel, it was just a mess. Um, now mind you, at the end of all of that, after I had reinstalled in things a million times, uh, I developed a you know, keen understanding about how all this stuff worked. Um, the other thing was, it opened my eyes to a world I didn't know existed. For a long time, I, like so many other people, thought that anything you put on a computer had to be purchased and, more importantly, couldn't be altered, particularly the operating system. Uh, like many, I was used to going to the store, paying an exorbitant amount for an overpackaged box of five and a quarter inch floppies and later CD-ROMs, <clears throat> spending hours installing and reinstalling the stuff. Uh, now, it, sadly, the installation part has not really gone away, but these days it's two or three clicks. Um, but as a student, in particular at that time, uh, the notion of not having to pay anything or pay very little was extremely appealing. And I also love the customizable nature of open source applications. So what do we mean when we say open source? Open source is a model that promotes universal access through a free license to a product's designer blueprint and universal redistribution of that designer blueprint. In terms of software and formats, where the term is most widely used, it means that the software is freely available, as is its source code, and a user is able to download and install the software to as many machines as they like. They're also allowed to alter the source code, but if they choose to distribute their altered version of the application, they must do so at no charge and also release the source code. This is where the free license comes in. Now, you might wonder, for uh, anybody who's actually downloaded open source software before, why certain applications, particularly distributions of Linux or Unix, etc., might cost money. Uh, this is because they bundle it with other things, and it's basically you're paying for added features. For the actual operating system, or software application as it might be, you can go to the website and download it free of charge. That's always been the case, and it always will be. Uh, it's going to come with all sorts of other stuff, too, um, which you might end up paying for if you decide to buy that little application. Sorry, the, you know, the uh, donation version, as they call it. Um, it. But it's usually in the form of, again, donations, support, and featured content. Now, let's have a shefty at EPUB, EPUB sorry, look. <laughs> old, old habit, picking that word up from my dad. Um, so, 
I'm sure many of you know this, EPUB both two and three are open standards created by the International Digital Publication Forum, or the IDPF, which like its web counterpart, the W3 Consortium, is an amalgamation of people from publishing companies, software companies, nonprofit organizations, and private individuals. It's not owned by any single person. So it's an open standard. Um, it's also a living standard that allows anyone and everyone to offer suggestions for its improvement, which can come in the form of EPUB support of certain technologies, whether that be CSS, JavaScript, et cetera, possible redundancies, and internal faults. Just so you know, the uh, PDF I've got here has links throughout it. Um, in this case, it takes us directly to the specification. And I've linked, well, sorry, the landing page with the specification. Um, but throughout this thing, uh, sorry, throughout this presentation, I have specs linked here. This one has XML, XHTML, SVG, CSS, and JavaScript. Sorry, I went through to that slide a little early. But um, EPUB is built on and supports several other key standards, which are these guys. Um, almost all of which are run by the W3 Consortium. Now, the IDPF also runs specifications uh, that are very that are actually particular to EPUB, uh, but I'm not really going to go into those because what uh, the point of this webinar is talking about open source tools that you can use, uh, you know, to create eBooks basically. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that all of the specifications were in there for your interest. Um, the reason that they support all of these uh, specs uh, is because at its basis, EPUB is nothing more than a zipped archive of a uh, well-formed and ex occasionally extremely well-designed web pages. Now, EPUB itself, though, does uh, limit what uh, what it's able to use from these specifications. Uh, it doesn't have anywhere near the full interactivity of JavaScript, for example. And even though EPUB 3 does accept a great deal out of CSS and HTML5, um, that's the standard rather than the devices. Now, all of these files are editable in a plain text editor, which I'm sure a number of you know, but uh, Heaven forbid any of you are using Dreamweaver to work on eBooks. Uh, first of all, the cost alone, but anyway. Uh, so all operating systems from OS X to Windows to Linux and on uh, all contain simple plain text editors that you can use to edit these files. I mean, they're embedded, they're not, tech, they're not actually open source, but they come with your operating system. Um, in Windows, this is Notepad. In OS X, it's text edit, and there's uh, gedit in Linux, et cetera. But these particular editors that are built into your OS are actually extremely limited in scope and they offer very limited functionality. Not the least of which is that you cannot tell any difference between tags and data. Uh, everything appears in black. Now, while you know, the ultimate goal of this is to talk mainly about open source software applications for ebook development, the first two applications I'm going to show you are not actually open source. Uh, but at the same time, they're not going to cost you a penny. Uh, this is known as freeware, which means that you can that while the software application is free, the source code is proprietary, and you're typically not allowed to distribute the software or alter its source code, which isn't available anyway. That said, you're allowed to install it on as many machines as you like, as it is free. So the two applications are Text Wrangler and Notepad++. Uh, they're both extremely powerful text editors that are 100% free and available for download at any time. For any Mac users on this call, you can access Text Wrangler right now by logging into the App Store. Um, or you can visit the links that are in this PDF. Uh, I've got Text Wrangler going straight to Barebones website. And Notepad++ is right here.
Now, while I do prefer Text Wrangler due to a lot of its automatic capabilities, um, for example, you can append lines with tags very, very quickly uh, just by using a few menu controls. Um, it's only available for Mac Intel-based computers. Uh, sadly, no edition exists for Text Wrangler for Windows. That said, Notepad++ uh, is a very worthy alternative if you're using a PC. You can do all of the same things, but there's increased automated functionality in Text Wrangler. Like I said, those menus where you can choose uh, various quick, quick fire things to do, getting rid of line breaks, getting rid, uh, sorry, adding tags, it can be done extremely quickly. Now you can do the exact same thing in Notepad++ uh, through the use of regular expressions. Um, and the lovely thing about both of these, before I get into regex, uh, is that uh, both of these editors have something, I mean, it sounds kind of simple, but it's absolutely lovely. All the tags, all sorts, all types of content are color-coded, uh, which makes your life a million times easier. You can also collapse, co uh, collapse tags, um, open them up, etc. Got some screenshots of Text Wrangler here. By the way, anytime in this uh, PDF where there's a name of a piece of software, there's a link to where you can get it, or in the case of uh, specifications, where that specification is. Now, this one looks awfully cluttered, but I was looking for a whole pile of windows that showed a whole pile of stuff, and so there you go. <laughs> anyway. Um, but this is more like what you're going to see uh, standard code, you know, just putting in a div class, spans, you're going to have H2s, that sort of thing. But all color code is fantastic. Now, regardless of what operating system or text editor you're, editor you're using, I do recommend that you download the user manual for Text Wrangler. It's freely available to everybody. And there's a link right here to it. Uh, this will take you directly to the PDF, but I just uh, made an image of the first page of Chapter 8. Because Chapter 8 supplies an excellent primer in the use of regular expressions using grep, uh, which is a powerful set of codes that allows you to do a massive and complex search, sorry, do massive complex, massive and complex search and replace patterns. Uh, for example, I once converted all of the text from a huge PDF uh, for a nonfiction book into plain text so I could make the ebook. Fair enough, we all do that. Um, and after the conversion, there were thousands of words in the document with a period between the letters. Um, while I don't have a huge amount of experience using regex, um, I was able to formulate exactly what sort of lines of code for the search and replace pattern out of this manual. I, I did it in about five, ten minutes. While you could do, um, you know, looking through the whole thing for periods between characters, fine, but it will take you days, um, and you can't do a simple uh, search and replace unless you went search, uh, just finding, like find and replace. If you just looked for a single period, that would take forever. Um, now, the expressions in here uh, and the lines of, uh, sorry, the types of search patterns, uh, they work both in Text Wrangler and Notepad++. And they're also going to work in any major text editor, um, although sometimes the syntax is very. Uh, for example, the expensive and proprietary editor uh, UltraEdit has its own set of expressions, uh, but the functionality is exactly the same. I don't know why they did that. Maybe they thought they were being cute or something, but the nice thing is, is that you can find a table where the matching expressions, which are in the manual, um, so, I'm sorry, uh, in, the, in the manual they have the expressions listed and they work pretty much anywhere, uh, but there are, there's the odd uh, other editor out there that's got matching ones, um, sorry uh, about that, but sorry, that's not clear at all, I apologize, it's weird talking to a computer screen when I can't hear any feedback, but anyway, you can sort out the patterns, trust me, all you have to do is go to their website, but if you're using these pieces of software which are freely available, your way to the races. Uh, basically, I can't recommend this PDF enough. Even if you don't use Text Wrangler, it's so handy uh, for just plain text editing. It's one of the best ones out there. 
Okay. Now many of you are undoubtedly aware of the cost and limitations of the Adobe Creative Suite, uh, which comprises Photoshop, Illustrator, Acrobat, and InDesign, amongst others. Uh, just for the record, uh, while I am a big fan of open source software, uh, I also recognize the proprietary software can be excellent, and I won't lie, the Creative Suite does have some fantastic stuff. But I do personally feel that their licensing agreements are positively draconian, uh, and they're also, they also seem to be making a move to putting everything in the cloud, uh, which I feel is a major concern for book publishers, given that so much of our uh, material is both, uh, you know, there are copyright issues, there are legal issues, particularly with nonfiction books. Um, I, the notion of it being up in the cloud, no matter how secure, I think is wary for a lot of people. And what Adobe's pushing towards is the idea that they'll move all their software to the cloud, um, which I find kind of odd. But then again, you know, things are changing. Um, and then, of course, there's the cost. Well, cheaper than the ones, uh, than the ones $1,500 a pop for Corp Express for anyone who used that. It's still a ridiculously priced software suite. Uh, the Creative Suite, I think, starts at bare bones at $1,000 per license. Now, all four of these applications, so Photoshop, Illustrator, Acrobat, and InDesign, uh, have open source alternatives, but I feel that only two of them, Illustrator and Photoshop, um, have alternatives that are almost on par. The other ones you can fudge with a little bit, um, Things are changing and things are moving, but, and which is why I wanted to let you know about them. Uh, but the layout alternative is a open source program called Scribus. Um, Scribus is fine for a sort of basic layout type of book, but when you compare it with the functionality of InDesign, um, it, I'm sorry, InDesign really wins out on that one. It's one of the few times where I have to completely capitulate to prepare proprietary software. Uh, but at the same time, this piece of software has been uh, moving for quite some time, and there will be increased functionality as time goes on. Now, one big drawback uh, with this program in particular, and it's not their fault, uh, it's strictly Adobe. Uh, but Adobe is very wary, as I'm sure many of you know, of uh, releasing um, uh, you know, the structure of their file formats, particularly their proprietary ones, so AI, Adobe Illustrator, PSD, Photoshop Document, and INDD, which is InDesign Document, which is the one where uh, Scribus would love to get its hands on so it could import InDesign documents. Currently, it cannot. Uh, some of the later al uh, image alternatives that I'll be talking about, namely Inkscape and the GIMP, uh, can actually open a great deal of formats, so data interchange is not a problem. Sadly, it is for Scribus, but I would, if I were you, keep an eye on this piece of software. Things are going for it. They, it's gone by leaps and bounds in the past couple of years, and I think it can go nowhere but up. Now, for full Acrobat, um, there's really no alternative. In terms of ebook development, realistically, what you need to be able to do uh, with a PDF is uh, be able to read it, scan it, uh, copy from it, etc. When creating ebooks, I realize the world of print is entirely different, um, but the nice thing is that there are a couple of really good pieces of software uh, that are completely free and open source. Uh, for uh, dealing with PDFs. Uh, based on the PostScript uh, programming language that Adobe came out with uh, whenever the 80s and 90s, um, PDF has become you know, hugely prevalent and let's face it, anyone making an ebook is often going to be doing so from a PDF unless they're working from a digital first workflow. Um, now, a lot of the pieces of software I've been showing you have been Mac grabs, but I want to make, be absolutely clear that a number of these pieces of software, in fact, almost 
all except possibly scribe it, so I'm sorry I'll look that up. Uh, but all the others uh, have, uh, they're open for all major operating systems. This one, however, PDF Exchange Viewer, which is the best free uh, alternative to Acrobat, is only available for the PC. Um, there are some good pieces of software also available for the Mac, uh, but this one, when it comes to if you want a good, really good alternative to Acrobat, this is the one you want. Um, you can copy, move, re take the reorder, you can do all sorts of stuff with this. Um, in terms of a digital, uh, tr digital books, digital output, etc. This one is bar none the best. Um, because I have a Mac at home, I don't actually have it, but um, I do have it at work. So. Uh, this one's not too bad. This is a program called Skim. Um, Skim is open, completely open source, so the source code is available. Uh, meanwhile, P PDF Exchange Viewer is freeware. Um, but Skim uh, is a great piece of software for editing PDFs, taking text out of PDFs, um, and scan, scanning the data. It's available for the Mac. Um, as Actually, I think it's also available for the PC. Um, but it is for just straightforward ebook development. It's fine. It's great. It's not as powerful as PDF Exchange here, but it is a uh, half decent piece of software. And it's again free, and you can alter it if you, you know, feel up to it. Sorry. Oh, and uh, sorry, I realized I talked about something a little earlier when I was looking at my next paragraph of notes. Uh, anyway, um, just so you know, uh, when it comes to PDFs, I often use Skim to uh, take all of the content out, and I'll use Reader. Yes, I do use a piece of proprietary software, who knows, apart from InDesign. Um, to uh, read them. In Skim you can read too, but I'm just so used to Reader, I've been using it for decades. In fact, one of the computers I have here doesn't have a single bit of proprietary software on it apart from stuff that's embedded in the operating system. Okay, uh, I'd like to move on to image programs, uh, specifically programs that deal with vector-based images or an open source alternative to Adobe Illustrator and pixel-based images or an alternative to Adobe Photoshop. Uh, again, in the interest of full, dis, uh, full disclosure, full transparency, I'm sorry, uh, the raw power of Photoshop and Illustrator uh, is unmatched in either paid or free software. But with regards to ebook development, um, there are, these alternatives are terrific and they will serve pretty much any need you need. It's just that if you're doing extremely high-end work, then uh, these guys are going to fall a little flat. But in, realistically, in terms of ebooks, who's really doing that? You would end up with a file that's 300 megabytes, and no one's going to accept that. Okay, so first I'd like to talk about Inkscape. Uh, the other one, by the way, is the GIMP. Okay. So Inkscape is an open source uh, vector-based illustration program that uses the W3 Consortium's uh, scalable vector graphic format as its main file format. This is known as SVG. I'm sure some of you have heard about it. Um, I'm actually going to go on about it at length shortly um, because I am a huge fan of the format. Uh, the program is free, 100%, and it is uh, available for every major operating system. It can do a lot of the same stuff that Illustrator can, uh, including basic shapes, paths, uh, got a text tool, uh, clones, transformations, gradients, grouping, you, you know, a lot of the basic stuff that we, we've all come to love from Illustrator. Um, you can type text on a path. Uh, and you can also, and this is the great thing, uh, you can actually get into the actual editing of an SV and SVG element, uh, sorry, SVG image as an XML document. You can do it directly in the software. 
Uh, it supports a lot of formats too, which is fantastic. Uh, it supports EPS, which is a great interchange format if you're using uh, Illustrator and you need to get something to someone. Uh, obviously deals with PostScript, JPEG, PNG, TIFF, um, and uh, other uh, vector-based formats. Uh, I think it can deal with even if someone, if anyone remembers freehand, it can deal with that, those. Um, while it doesn't have, as I mentioned, doesn't have all of the bells and whistles of Illustrator, I feel it more than suffices for web and ebook publishing. Uh, the SVG native format alone makes it a powerful tool. I love that it uses that as its base format. Uh, Art can be created using its import functions, and then you can turn it into an SVG item, and then you can go right into the code itself. So SVG, I know I'm moving slightly away from the software to the actual file format, but it's an open standard, and I'd like to address it because it is a file format I feel has been overlooked for far too long by the publishing industry. Uh, by the way, the specification is here. So you've got the whole thing at your fingertips. Um, so it's an XML-based image format for two-dimensional uh, graphics that has been specified by the W3, uh, the W3C, I'm sorry, uh, since 1999. Uh, like XML, they didn't see the point in really revamping it because it was nigh on perfect. It's only been changed to 1.1 since it started, uh, unlike XML, which stayed at 1.0 and probably will never move. So. SVG images and all of their elements and attributes are defined using XML. As XML files, you can actually alter these things in any text editor. You don't need necessarily to even download Inkscape to alter these things. Uh, now, actual SVG images can be dynamic and interactive. Uh, you can animate them to a point. Uh, but as we'll see shortly, that has limitations in the ebook uh, specification. Uh, the name alone should give you an indication of why it's so strong. Unlike a JPEG, uh, a scalable vector graphic is not going to lose, it's not going to blur or lose aspects of its appearance when you zoom in and out of the object. You can't say the same about pixel-based objects <coughs> because, uh, as I'm sure a number of you have dealt with Photoshop, the more you zoom into a piece of art, uh, the more pixelated and broken up it gets. Um, now, while there are these limitations to SVG in EPUB uh, with regards to the enhanced versions of them all, uh, you can still use them for web publications and they'll work perfectly well. Um, now, one cool, really cool thing about SVG is thanks to the EPUB 3 specification, you are now allowed to use SVG as a content document within an EPUB. So it's no longer just a case of dealing with an XHTML file and then you link an image to it. You can actually use the, the image file itself so long as it has an SVG extension as a content document and you declare it in your manifest in the OPF. Um, I have a feeling that uh, if used properly, this format uh, is going to move things in a very big way so long as the readers get up to speed and start you know, ad adopting more EPUB 3 uh, capabilities. Uh, in the world of graphic novels and comic books in particular, uh, because they deal with color line images, etc., in two-dimensional space. Now, uh, I mentioned some of the limitations of SVG. Um, I'm going to go over some of them. These are chosen, sorry, these are picked directly from the EPUB 3 specification. So it's got to meet the following criteria. Every word here, by the way, is taken directly from the spec. Whoop. Okay. So it must meet the conformance constraints for XML documents defined in XML conformance, which happens to be in the spec. Uh, basically, this means it has to be well-formed XML. If it's not, it's not going to work.
Uh, so sort of reiterating it, it's got to be an SVG 1.1 uh, that's valid to the content document schema that's in EPUB. So just make sure it's a valid SVG file and that it works uh, and that it has an SVG file extension. Um, seems to, there are a couple of restrictions, which I'm going to get into in just a moment. It's got to adhere to the accessibility guidelines, just like so much else, so many other things in the EPUB spec, you know, it's got to adhere to the DAISY specification. And it's got to use the, uh, the file extension SVG. Here's the one. You can animate um, uh, various parts of SVG. Not going to work in any EPUB. Just like the proprietary file format GIF, or some of you known as GIF, um, which has had a resurgence on the web in the past little while. Um, those image files uh, must be static and same with SVG. Even though they have the capability to do minor animation, uh, you're not able to, to use these specific file formats in that way in an EPUB, at least currently. Uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, for the time being that's the case. Uh, I feel that this format, as I said, is overlooked dramatically. Uh, it's an open standard. You can find all the information you want on it at any time. And uh, I think it should very well become the norm for illustrated material in ebooks. Uh, it hasn't yet, because um, everybody's used to the print world. So tips are being turned into JPEGs, etc. Right? But there's no reason why you couldn't do it in uh, SVG. Thing is, uh, you don't even need a powerful computer to alter SVG. As they're XML files, you can deal with them directly through uh, a text editor like Text Wrangler or Notepad++. Okay, next one. GIMP, which stands for GNU Image Manipulation Program. Uh, it's an image editing application that's open source and freely available to everyone. It started out life in the world of Unix and Linux, but it is now available for every operating system. Uh, it's got many of the major tools used for imagery touching and editing. Uh, so, you know, drawing, resizing, cropping, etc. Uh, it can handle all of the major file formats, GIF, JPEG, TIFF, EPS, you name it. But uh, just so you guys know, it does deal with, um, it's got a native file format called uh, XCF, uh, which is great when you're dealing with the GIMP. However, you don't want to use it as a data interchange format. In other words, do all your editing as an XCF. Fine, do everything you want. Save it as something else when you transfer it. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this from when layout software could not deal with the native file formats of Adobe. So I don't think it's that much of a drawback. Um, and it does support TIFF and it does support EPS, et cetera. So you can export it to pretty much anything. Okay. Um, there can be some issues with uh, releases of the GIMP, unfortunately, because it's dealt with by a huge consortium of people. This is one of the biggest open source projects that's, uh, that's existed outside of the world of operating systems. Um, so sometimes there can be lags between iterations of the software, but you can still get your hands on it. Uh, and again, there's a link directly here uh, in the PDF where you can go and download the GIMP to your heart's content. Uh, just so you know, this little dude's name is Wilbur. Okay, audio. Uh, with the release of the EPUB 3 standard in 2011, we're now able to embed audio directly within an ebook without having to resort to an external link. Uh, like many other things with EPUB 3, unfortunately, uh, the spec says this, most devices don't deal with it. Um, in fact, most devices don't even have full support for all of the HTML5 compliant tags. Uh, now, the tag you use to embed audio, which is why I put this in, uh, in tag format here between carrots, uh, is audio. You're looking at it. Um, now, should you choose to uh, embed audio in your EPUB, 
Uh, don't go out and buy Pro Tools. It's a waste of your money. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, unless you're if hardcore in the audio world, don't bother. What you want is this. This is a piece of software called Audacity. Um, it's fantastic. It's free. It's open source. Uh, it's available for all major operating systems. Uh, and even the, what the bare bones basic program is fantastic for editing bits in down to hundreds of a second, which is great for anyone who wants to deal with text to speech pattern, uh, sorry, text to speech functionality in an EPUB. Um, and it's the main format it uses, of course, is the widely widely used MP3. Uh, there are piles of plugins for this piece of software, um, and including, and I kid you not here, like. Uh, emulators of module synthesizers. It's crazy. There's all sorts of great stuff out for this piece, uh, for Audacity. Um, and the price is right, and it's a handy, useful piece of software. In fact, I found this thing to be far easier to use than a lot of other, sorry, user-friendly, I should have said a minute or two ago, uh, far easier to use than a lot of other pieces of audio software. Um, right. Um, Video. So uh, it also it EPUB three also allows for the tag video, um, which allows developers to put uh, ebook developers that is to put video directly within an EPUB file. There's a lot of limitations in terms of the codex and the size of the file. There's lots of documentation out there, um, but what I wanted to bring up was stuff that you can use to analyze uh, video files. And the best piece of software out there, hands down, is VLC Media Player. This can handle anything. Um, there, in terms of converting things, maybe not the best, but in terms of analyzing a uh, piece of video, uh, this thing cannot be beaten. Uh, in fact, I know people who use it and they don't even bother with proprietary software. There's no point when you have this available. Now, in terms of editing, stuff. Um, you know what? These two are fine. Okay, I know this is supposed to be an open source talk, but and these guys are definitely embedded in operating systems. Uh, but iMovie for the for OS X and Movie Maker for Windows, if realistically for EPUB development, we're not doing great we're not filmmakers, right? We just need to be able to cut small snippets of film. Uh, sorry, small snippets of video. Um, and to embed those in our EPUBs. Realistically, if we had a huge file, then that would end up being, um, sorry, a big movie or something embedded in a book. First of all, it's not a book. And secondly, that's going to make a huge file that pretty much every vendor is going to say no to. But in terms of just quick, snappy editing, these guys, really, they're fine. I have never had problems with them. So just recommend those. OK. Uh, the last area I'd like to talk about um, covers fonts. Now I'm talking here about digital formats, um, so I'm going to use the word font rather than typeface. Um, now, realistically, sorry, I've said that a lot today. It's been a long day. Um, they're a reality to fonts are a reality to anyone who's worked on the composition or design of digital or print work. Um, and let's face it, these things can be extremely expensive. Licensing alone can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds to thousands of dollars for a suite of font files. And even then, you might have functionality uh, problems dealing from one format, sorry, one area to another, one platform to another. Okay, to start, fonts come in four main flavors: T1 or PostScript fonts, TTF. For the Windows 8 the users out there, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Uh, true type font. Uh, OTF, open type font, uh, available for all operating systems. And then WOFF, uh, which is web open font format. Uh, again, specifications exist. I only put the three big ones here because T1 really doesn't apply to ebooks. Uh, it's a uh, older type of format. It's still terrific for print. I'm not denying that, but uh, they're of no use to ebook developers. So ignore T1. I just put them in there for completeness' sake. Uh, they're also not acceptable media types in the EPUB manifest either. 
TTF uh, is a widely used standard in computing, uh, but obviously if you're from a print background or used to that or, you know, there's going to be interchange between your ebook and your print book, um, you might be wary about these things because they're not that great in, the, in other formats. They're fine for ebooks. So if you're doing a digital only publication, go for it. Um, I generally suggest you avoid them though, particularly as let's, most books are coming in multiple formats. Okay, OTF, as far as the publishing industry is concerned, I think is the holy grail of font formats. Uh, they per work perfectly well in digital and print, and you can maintain a the exact same design across platforms. For example, if you were to use a TTF uh, and then you wanted to do something else in another format, you'd probably have to find an OTF or a T1 that would roughly match it, but it's not going to match it exactly. You can't, they never do, just because of the nature of the way they're composed. Now, uh, WOFF, this is a relatively new standard that is actually open uh, from the W3C. Oops. Um, it's, a, it's actually a compression format uh, for existing TTF and OTF formats. Uh, the W3 is pushing web developers to use it as a standard. Uh, I find this very interesting. Uh, we'll see what happens. But, um, but the nice thing is, is like these two above it, it's a completely valid format for EPUB. Uh, so it would be uh, font slash, um, what is it? Font slash uh, WOFF, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Now back to the cost on these, not just the formats. Uh, the TTF and OTF in particular can be very expensive depending on the font foundry or uh, the people who own the font. Uh, great thing is there's a huge number of sites available uh, with free fonts for commercial and non-commercial use, but be sure to read the fine print on those because you want to make sure that, yeah, oh, you can use this for your website, that's fine, but as soon as you start selling something, then there's a problem. So make sure you read what, what it says on the uh, some examples are uh, Font Squirrel, Open Font Library, Duff Font. Uh, interesting thing about Font Squirrel, by the way, and I'm sorry I forgot to put those guys in a link. I'll, uh, I'll get that over to Jordan so he can send it out to the attendees. Um, but the thing about Font Squirrel is that it's actually got a converter on its website uh, that will allow you to convert a TTF and an OTF into a WOFF if you feel the need, or you think that would work for you. Now, the last piece of software I'm going to talk about is FontForge. Uh, while this is available for every major operating system, uh, I wasn't able to get a, a half-decent screenshot from, this is, this is definitely Unix or Linux. Um, but it is available for Windows, it is available for uh, uh, for OS X as well, um, and it is a piece of software to design and develop your own fonts. Um, I won't lie, I've never really done much with this, I've only tried it a little bit. Um, I think I made an I, <laughs> but uh, it is available, so if you feel extremely creative and nothing beats making it yourself to keep prices down, and uh, uh, mind you, you might have to but want to think about distributing, that's up to you but, uh, and your publishing program. But the, uh, there's a whole world out there of creating your own type uh, for those who might want to do so. And it is freely available and again, the link is here with this, is, and I do apologize for the most hideous website I'm going to show you tonight, or this afternoon. But you know what, everything you need is here. So, right there. <laughs> So, uh, while I am a strong proponent of open source software, uh, particularly for operating systems and web publishing, um, and ebook development, obviously, uh, I'd like to address some current some problems with the model. There's a couple. Uh, open source is fantastic because it's free, customizable, and practically beholden to no one. Uh, but I think these last two areas uh, are some of its biggest drawbacks. 
because of the sheer number of people, companies, and organizations pumping out versions of software, it can be difficult to keep, uh, keep track of them all or, more importantly, get support for your software. Software breaks down, errors and bugs occur, uh, it's just a fact of life in development. Uh, getting support for some open source applications, not all, uh, or flavors of those applications can be difficult. Luckily, there's a whole world of resources at your fingertips in the form of forums and discussion boards and even you know FAQs. As funny as that sounds, you'd think those would be out of date these days, but nope, nope, they're still handy. Um, someone's asked the question before you, and you can find the answer. Uh, now, however, this can also be time-consuming. Um, now, there are a lot of the pieces of software I've shown you today. Um, are there are companies and organizations behind it? It's not just someone in their basement. Particularly the GIMP, Inkspace, uh, Tech, well, Text Wrangler, Notepad Plus Plus, of course, are freeware rather than open source, but even still, um, and um, uh, Scribus is run by a group of people as well. Uh, so there's a group dealing uh, with, they're in charge of all major releases, uh, but as I mentioned with the GIMP, uh, there can be time between those releases, but at least you get some half-decent support out of those bigger groups. So it's worth doing a little bit of research. Now the nice thing about them though is even though there might be a lot of time between major releases, uh, beta releases and sub-releases can and do come out on a regular basis. So. I would say your biggest hurdles are support and the length of time between uh, releases. I don't think they're catastrophic problems, uh, but they can be issues. And realistically, we've all got books to get out one way or another, and sometimes dealing with a piece of software can be a pain rather than just dealing with IT or directly to see how you can sort that out. Um, also open source uh, software applications can be a bit of a hurdle with a large scale organization. Um, that said, you could do it at the departmental level in most cases. But um, on a smaller scale, they, I think they work great, especially for you know, a group of, you know, say a production team of anywhere from one to three people. I think this stuff is fantastic, digital or otherwise. 